Good evening. Welcome to Planets, Moons and Stars uh, Chat. I'm Dave Rothery. I'm the chair of S283 Planetary Science and the Search for Life at the Open University. And with me this evening is my colleague, Judith Croston. Hi, everybody. Um, we're here mainly to answer your questions, but we'll deal with some news items early on. Um, you'll see there are some widgets. We'd like to get some feedback from you just about where you are and what you're studying and, and what you like. And we have had some questions asked in advance, but we'd love for you to ask us questions live. So just use the chat window to ask uh, questions of us as we go along, please. And we'll deal with as many of them as we can. OK, as I said, I chair S283. That's the Level 2 Planetary Science course, um, essentially. Judith shares 282. This event is open for 283, 282, Level 1 students, people who've done the Moon's MOOC, people who've studied with us in the past, the whole OU Planetary Science Astronomy community, really. So whoever you are, welcome. Indeed. Now, Judith, please tell us about yourself. OK, um, sure. So, um, so as Dave has said, I'm the chair of S282 Astronomy, uh, but I'm also um, a research astronomer and um, I do observational astronomy. So I use telescopes to take observations mainly of, of galaxies. And I'll show you some pictures of the sorts of galaxies that I look at at the moment. So I don't really use optical telescopes at all. Um, so there's a lovely picture of one of our OU optical telescopes behind us. Um, I don't use those telescopes. I use uh, radio telescopes. You use bits of old wire, I don't you? I use bits of old wire. That's exactly right. Yes. Yeah, so I've got a picture of a bit of old wire that I've been using to study the cosmos. Um, oh, no, that's not the right one. Um, so I've got a picture of um, a telescope called the International LOFAR Telescope. And this is uh, one of the main um, telescopes that I'm using at the moment. And what's really exciting about LOFAR is it's a huge um, pan-European telescope. So it's a network of uh, bits of old wire, as you might, <laughs> might describe them. Um, High-tech uh, telescope components, which are spread across, across Europe. Uh, and um, it's, um, uh, it's centered in the Netherlands with stations going out across lots of different countries, all the way from Ireland to, to Poland. And um, we have an antenna here in the UK. I actually helped to build it. So that's the picture that you can see in the top right hand corner. That's me in the middle putting together some, some bits of old wire. So what's um, really exciting about LOFAR is the individual components are quite cheap. But if you put together really large numbers of them, then it actually gives us a telescope that can basically see deeper into the radio universe than we have ever been able to see before. Is that a telescope the size of Western Europe, effectively, it when is, you link those it together? It is indeed, yes. Yeah, it's a very large telescope. And the advantage of doing that is that it gives you um, a lot of what we call spatial resolution, so the ability to see um, really nice details. So um, so what's, what I'm actually doing with these, these radio observations is looking at galaxies. And um, galaxies produce radio waves. Our own Milky Way produces radio waves. So the picture on the left here is a famous spiral galaxy called M51. Uh, and um, and it's, um, it, the radio waves that you can see here, which are taken by, by the LOFAR telescope, are produced um, from supernovae, essentially. So particles get accelerated to really high energies. So the radio tells us something about the stars in the galaxy and the star formation. And so we can yeah. use it to study all sorts of things. The picture on the right is the sort of object I spend most of my, my time studying, which is an, a radio galaxy. Um, this is a sort of active galaxy. And if you look at the, um, the little um, whitish glowing circle in the center of the picture, that's the actual galaxy. So there are something like 100 billion stars in that really tiny central region. And then you've got these huge, big red plumes of material. These are relativistic jets of particles shooting off essentially into uh, intergalactic space. And so my research really is about understanding these exotic galaxies and what they what they do. When you say particles, is that mainly mm. protons? Or? It's well, that's an interesting question, actually. Um, in fact, that's one of the questions that my research tries to answer. <laughs> okay. But um, there are definitely electrons and positrons, lep what we call leptons there. And in some of these jets, we think there are protons in some we don't. Oh. So it's highly energetic um, subatomic particles, basically. Um, and, and we can learn quite a lot, quite a lot about them from the observations. Something else that um, um, that uh, so, so, so what, what, what we're trying to do at the moment really is map out very large numbers of these. So we've got um, a picture here, which is um, lots of lots of different galaxies um, that you can that you can see. So hopefully you can see this picture with um, with some galaxies across the, uh, the sky um, and uh, and 
this is, this is, we're, we're detecting sort of millions of new radio sources, which are all different types of galaxies across, um, across the sky and doing a really big survey. Uh, but at the same time, you don't just, you, you can do things other than galaxies as well. So one interesting thing that we're trying to do with LOFAR is uh, look for um, radio waves from exoplanets. So that's something that people haven't really um, detected before. But um, we think that they'll tell us something quite interesting about exoplanets because um, it's... Um, uh, radio waves tend to tend to be produced where you've got strong magnetic fields, and that's quite interesting for, for planets. Um, it might tell us something about habitability if the host stars have lots of magnetic fields and so on. So is that meant to be an, an M dwarf? Uh, that you know, is, small yes. Red dwarf yeah, that's star right. Yes. So it's a planet a, close it's, to a, it. it's a low mass okay. star, a planet quite close in, um, and and the interactions because it's a really magnetically active star, you you produce radio waves, and that tells you you can use that to learn about the. The, the planets and the star systems they live in and and maybe tell us something about their their habitability so um so that's the sort of sort of stuff i'm interested in how about you what's uh, what are you up to on well, the, the research side at the I moment i also work on planets close to stars well a planet mm -hmm. close to a star because mm -hmm. i work on mercury i'm involved in right. the european space yes. agency's mission to mercury which is in space now we mm -hmm. launched just over a year ago it won't mm -hmm. get into orbit till 2026 but right, I've, yes, a bit of a I've wait spent, to get to Mercury. I've had three trips to the continent in the mm. past three weeks. Yesterday I was examining a Mercury PhD mm. in Paris. But what we do here, um, I've got several PhD students working mm. on making geological maps of Mercury. Mm. Here's um, the first map <coughs> we published, partly with European Commission funding, led by my, well, he was my PhD student, now my postdoc, Jack Wright. <coughs> And this is a map of one quadrangle of Mercury, just this part of the planet here. It's one fifteenth of the globe. It's in the northern hemisphere. And um, what it's showing is craters of different ages. The, the, yellow, the craters with the yellow ejector are the youngest. The craters with the green ejector are the next oldest. And the brown ejectors from the oldest craters at all, of all on this free crater classification. And this pale tone across the north is... Um, a region of relatively young, smooth volcanic plains, vast mm. fields of lava that have been erupted on Mercury, and there's older lavas in the south. And a particularly interesting feature, which we didn't realise mm. was going to be there on Mercury till Messenger, NASA's mission, got mm. there, is features like this one here. This is a feature called Natair Facula. The um, it's a red stipply pattern is an explosively distributed deposit that's come out of this volcanic vent in the centre. So we've got explosive volcanic eruptions, mm. throwing plumes of stuff out and then mm. fall back to the ground. And you can only get an explosive volcanic eruption if you've got s some elements that will turn into gases. It's ah. that's basically volatile mm. material. And you, we did not mm. expect a planet as close to the sun as Mercury to be rich in volatiles. Mm. It's yeah. a bit of a poser. We don't know mm. what these gases are. Mm. So is, is Beppe Colombo going to help? Beppe Colombo will then? help. There's, there's hints. Mm that the explosive deposit uh, is depleted in sulfur. It's been measured mm. once on the biggest deposit on mm. the planet. We will have the spatial resolution to map the smaller ones and see right. if it's loss of sulfur dioxide or carbonyl sulfide. We don't know what, mm. but some sulfur-bearing gas is probably what's been lost. But we're going there to find out. It's going to be a, going to mm. be a great mission. Mm. Um, great. And before we mm. go on to the questions, nobody's asked a live... Oh, it's, we've got one live question here. Well, thank you, David Smalley. We'll come to that, that question. Um, but we just want to talk a little bit about things that have gone on in the news. Judith, what's caught your attention in the news lately? Hmm. Well, so there, there's been one interesting news story, which um, some of you might have, uh, might have been aware of, which is um, some quite good news for astronomy, which is the recent um, Nobel Prize announcements. So hmm. um, half of the Nobel Prize for physics has... Um, <coughs> excuse me has gone to uh, the discovery of exoplanets. So um, I think that's something that crops up in- That uh, was Michelle Mayer that, and Didier That's Kellos. right, indeed, yeah, yes. Yeah, no, yeah. you can read about that in uh, book two of S283. We have a, a picture of them in the book <coughs> in the younger days, in the mid nineties, when they discovered the first exoplanet <coughs> of a conventional star. This is 51 Pegasi B, isn't it? Yes. This yeah, was right. this was discovery of an exoplanet by that was radial velocity, wasn't it? It was a, it yes, was a, it was right, a yes, planet orbiting mm. the star, pulling the star to and fro, <laughs> so you get a Doppler shift as the planet orbits yes. the star. That's yes. The first. That's the that that's the first star. star. Yes, sun-like star yeah. with planet. 
because uh, yes, as a, as a radio astronomer, um, it's uh, important to point out that actually um, there was an earlier planet discovery uh, which was made through radio astronomy. So this was through observations of a pulsar. So pulsars are, um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, are rotating neutron stars. Yeah. Um, so they're ro rotating really fast, these compact objects, um, and they're sending out radio beams. And so you get these pulses. And then you can see, um, if you see irregularities in the pulses, that can give you a hint that something is maybe happening to make the pulsar wobble. So um, a couple of astronomers, um, Walt Shan and Frail, in 1992. So this was three years earlier than... Um, than the Nobel Prize but winning. It's also uh, in S283. It is. Oh, excellent. <laughs> good, good. The textbook is up to date. Um, so, um, so they actually uh, discovered two uh, planets orbiting um, a pulsar. And that's actually pretty interesting because you, ha you have to wonder how do you get a planet around yeah. a neutron star? Because um, we think the neutron stars are produced in um, supernovae. So you think that you, you have a massive star at the end of its life and it explodes. Um, so if you've got a planetary system around a star and then the star explodes, you might think, okay, how does the planet manage to survive that, uh, that explosion? Um, but actually, I think um, <coughs> the, uh, the best explanation is that it doesn't. And actually, the, um, the planets that, um, that we see around pulsars, those are planets that, uh, that probably formed after the supernova. So you, you, you destroy the environment of the star, and then it collapses back down and forms a disk and, and reforms some planets after the, um, after the neutron star has, has been made. So... So they so so they they're post supernova planets. Okay, very different to mm. our kind of planet. Yes. yes, interesting to know. About. Yes. So so how about you then? What what have you been reading about in the uh, planetary well, science and astronomy news recently? Well, the thing I wanted to talk about <coughs> tonight was the discovery of a bunch of new moons of Saturn. Um, mm. um, Scott Shepard and his team from the Carnegie Institute, using um, a telescope in Hawaii found 20 previously unknown moons of Saturn. 20. They're small, they're only a little less than about five kilometers across. Mm -hmm. And we've got a graphic showing how they orbit Saturn. They're a long way out from Saturn, mm -hmm. and they're outer irregular moons. Mm -hmm. And um, most of them go retrograde around the planet right, in, the, okay. in the opposite direction mm -hmm. of the planet spin because they're probably ah. captured bodies. Those are the, the, the red ones on that orbital mm -hmm. diagram. Oh, There's a green line there amongst that <laughs> sort of red hoop. And that's the moon that's going prograde around Saturn and amongst all the retrograde mm. ones. How do you manage that then? Well, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's tricky. Um, it's easier to capture objects into retrograde orbits than into prograde ah, orbits. The, okay. the prograde mm. bodies tend to be ones that form around a planet <coughs> from the spinning mass as the planet's condensing. Mm. But many of these individual retrograde moons probably arrived as a single body and then broke apart. Right. And uh, this moon that's going the right way around or against the flow of the traffic might hit one of the others in the future <laughs> and break them apart. Mm. But it looks very dangerous because of the scale, but yes. there's a lot of space in between mm. these. There's actually very three different groups of, um, of these moons of Saturn. Actually, there's mm. a, a little video we, we can play. Mm. Um, it, we'll, we'll run the video and, I'll, and you can find it on the internet. Go to YouTube and look for Saturn New Moons video and you can find this and other videos. But let's play the video now, and my voice will cut out while the video plays. The ring gas giant of Saturn, aptly named after the Roman god of wealth, has acquired some more celestial bling in the form of a moon king crown, as 20, yes 20 new moons have been confirmed in the orbit of the bejeweled planet, bringing its already gargantuan moon count up to 82. Now these newly found Saturnian satellites are gonna need some names, and that's where you come in. Due to the huge success of the Name Jupiter's Moons contest, Carnegie Science are again asking you, the public, just what these new moons should be called. That's a nice video. That was made by Andrew Roberts, who's on the Moons Facebook group. He's not an OU student, but his wife is. Um, he, he made that video and, um, and some other good videos. And in fact, he was able to name one of the moons of Jupiter from the mm. previous bunch of discoveries. Gosh. And that bunch of school kids from Cornwall calling mm. one of Jupiter's moons Pandia were, were part of that campaign. Mm, so if you fantastic. want to name one of Jupiter, one of Saturn's new moons, mm, it's got to be right. a giant from Gallic, Norse or Inuit mythology. And that right. big group of retrograde moons are Norse ones. So mm. get into your Norse mythology books and have a go. You've got till early December to, to name them. We've actually had um, a live question come in from David Smalley. Um, uh, relevant to moons, why do you think there are no known moons of Venus or Mercury? Mm, right. It's I think probably that's a one for, for me as a planetary scientist. Um, 
the sphere of influence of, um, of, of a planet um, is a matter of competition between the planet and the sun and what mm. they call the Hill sphere, the sphere of influence around Venus or Mercury, the closest planets to the sun, is smaller than it would be if those planets were further away. Mm. So it's harder to keep yes. a moon um, around a planet so yes. close mm. to um, uh, the sun. And you have to ask yourself, mm. how did the moons form? Mars has got two moons which might be captured asteroids. The Earth's moon is a result of um, a rather unusual giant impact collision that had just mm. the right distribution yes, of angular so velocity yes, to throw off a, a body into, uh, throw, throw, throw off a cloud of debris <clears throat> into orbit around the Earth. Mm. Um, the, the big moons of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune formed around the planets from the the the, 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 um, the, the protoplanetary disk mm. when those planets were growing. So moon formation in the outer solar system is different to the inner solar system. Mm. So there there are many factors, but it's pretty certain there are no permanent moons of Venus or Mercury. Mm. It's not just no known moons; they're yeah. not going to be there. I think mm. that's fairly just clear makes now. It too difficult. Mm. So let's deal with some questions that we had uh, in advance. Okay. So you've got one for, uh, no, I've got one for you, haven't yeah, I? Okay. Um, it's a question from an S282 student, Joe Sharp. Uh, she's asking a question about dwarf galaxies in the neighborhood of the Milky mm. Way. She says, the Canis major over density occurs about 12 by, uh, covers about 12 by 12 degrees in mm. the sky. Could another galaxy be so close that the stars appear so widespread that we wouldn't see it as a, an entity? I mean, could there be a galaxy colliding with the Milky Way that we just wouldn't notice? Hmm. Right, yes. So that is a very interesting question. And um, dwarf galaxies are really pretty fascinating, actually. So, um, so, so Canis Major is one particular dwarf galaxy, and it's one that's incredibly spread out on the sky. I can show you a, show you a picture of it um, a little bit later. But um, uh, it's only one of quite a lot of dwarf galaxies, actually. So, um, so the Milky Way, um, it turns out, um, I've got a graph here that shows the discovery of um, uh, dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way. And so, um, so this, the, the x-axis here is the year. So, um, so the, first, um, the first dwarf galaxies were discovered quite a long time ago, uh, but it wasn't really until the 2000s that... Um, the pace of discoveries really picked up, and that was with surveys like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which mm -hmm. were able to um, to do a lot of um, uh, cover really quite a large area of the the sky. So we now have more than fifty dwarf, known dwarf galaxies. So Canis Major is only one of quite a lot. Fifty dwarf galaxies associated, associated with the Milky, with Milky Way. Mil Milky Way. Wow. Most of them are pretty small, um, but Canis Major is spread out over a really uh, really wide area. So things like that are really diff difficult to detect because they're. Um, um, the individual stars are sort of spread out on a background of lots of other stars that are, that are just part of our, our galaxy. I think this is Joe's but, point, um, really. That's yeah. right, yeah. So, um, so I've got um, a picture here that shows sort of how the Canis Major galaxy actually looks. This isn't actually the observations, this is just a, a simulation. But what you can see here is that um, it's actually part of a what we call a tidal stream. So, um, so it's a galaxy that's in the process of being sort of stretched out and, and, um, and stripped, and lots of the stars are, are trailing out behind it. Uh, and we actually see lots of these tidal streams. So there are tidal streams um, from several different um, galaxies I, that are either in the process of being destroyed or that have been destroyed already. So these are some stellar streams. The colors here are how far away the stars are from us. So each dot here is a star. And you can see a few different streams stretching across the middle of the, uh, the image. This is quite a large area of sky. Um, these are stars, but gas does this as well. So this picture, this is the Milky Way galaxy um, across the center of the image. And the two bright blobs in the middle of all the pink stuff are the large and the small Magellanic clouds. So these are, are two, two big satellite galaxies. But the pink stuff is gas. So this is what's known as the Magellanic stream. So you've got this stream of gas that's being stripped from, from the galaxies. So, um, so we do have very good ways to detect um, uh, dwarf galaxies now. But the challenge is really what counts as a dwarf galaxy and what doesn't. Because um, Canis Major has a very low density of stars compared to the Milky Way. It's about 300 times less dense in terms of how spread out they are. So, so the question becomes, when is it a galaxy and when does it become a, a tidal stream? Um, and interestingly, one of the best ways we have of um, sort of understanding the history of the Milky Way and colliding galaxies and so on is actually looking at the stars in the Milky Way, looking at how fast they're moving in their orbits. And um, so I've got a movie here of... Um, 
the motion of some stars um, that are now part of the Milky Way. So this is looking back in time at a galaxy that collided with us in the past. And um, <clears throat> the researchers found that, um, that these, um, so these stars are now part of the Milky Way, but they have really interesting orbits and interesting chemistry that tells us that they have a different history to the other stars. So some of these are actually in retrograde orbits, like the um, Saturn moons that, that we yeah. were seeing earlier. So, so they're not orbiting in the same way as the other stars. But, uh, but this, this, this was a galaxy, and it's now a sort of stretched out remnant in the middle of our, our Milky Way. So, um, so this, the answer is sort of that, um, that we could be missing things, but we couldn't be missing a really big galaxy that's closer to us than, than Canis Major, because I think at that point it would really just be a stream of, of stars rather than a, right. a galaxy. Okay. So um, yes, dwarf galaxies, are, dwarf galaxies are really interesting. Yeah. So, um, so I've got a question for, for you, Dave, um, which is from um, an S283 student. Um, so Fiona Brown wanted to know um, about um, what the effects would be different if on the Earth if we didn't have the moon. So, so um, there wouldn't be tides, but, but what, uh, what, what else oh, would be different, well, no, she asks. No, there, there, there would be there tides. There would be tides. Uh, mm. Fiona and Judith, there <laughs> would be tides. Because um, if the Earth didn't have a moon, we'd still have the sun, and the of sun course. produces yeah. tides as well. The mm. tide-producing force from the sun is about half what the tide-producing force of the moon is. Mm. Yeah. Um, and when the sun and the moons pull are together, you get spring tides, and when the sun yes. and moon pull are at right angles, you get mm. neap tides. Mm. So we would have tides in the oceans if we had no moon at all. Mm. So when people say, oh, life would never have emerged from the oceans onto land if we didn't have a moon, that's mm. rubbish. Because even if you think you need tides to help life get from yeah, the oceans onto we land, have tides, we'd have tides from the moon. They'd just be different. Mm. Um, what the, the moon's most important effect, though, is probably to stabilise the Earth's axis. Ah, because the Earth's yeah. axis is tilted at 23 degrees to its orbit around the sun. That's why we mm. have seasons. Uh, and it wobbles a little bit wobbles right. just a few degrees, but it does mm. not have wild excursions like Mars. Yeah. Mars has had times in its past when it's lying on its side and times when it's upright. And that's mm. given really wild climate fluctuations on right. Mars. So and the main thing would be the climate then that would potentially be a bit more would have, changeable. Would, would be would have much wilder excursions mm. and, and very dramatic long periods of ice house mm. conditions. Now that wouldn't necessarily make the Earth uninhabitable for advanced life. Some people mm. say it would. I don't think so. Right. But it'd be harder mm. to, to sustain a civilization over a long period of time on a mm. planet that Things were a bit unpredictable. Mm. Um, so I think I'm glad we have a moon. <laughs> yes. And of course yeah. the moon tempted us out into space. If we didn't mm. have an easy object to go and land on, would we have gone out into the solar system at all with people? Mm. Yes, good question. Mm. Um, let me deal with a, a live question that came in before it goes off my screen. Um, Jeff Catchpole is asking, how small does the moon have to be before you just call it dust and not a moon? Yes. But th there Fair is enough. no agreed lower size mm. limit to, to what a moon is. Mm. But a definition about what a planet is based yes. on its orbit. Yes. You know, planets and dwarf planets and yes, minor bodies. Indeed. But moons, mm. any single object that goes round a planet we call a moon, unless it's a bit of a time, unless it's just a fragment of stuff in a mm. planetary ring system, and, and we can't see system. the individual mm. particles there. It's just just some ring material. Mm -hmm. But there isn't a definition of how small an object has to be, how small an object can be, and still be a moon. Mm. In fact, there are asteroids which are only a few hundred meters across, yes. but have <laughs> ten meter moons of their own. Yes. So. Um, you wouldn't call the 10 metre bit of rock going round Saturn a moon of Saturn. You wouldn't no. even see it from the Earth. But you <laughs> but see these 10 metre moons mm. of, of double asteroids when they come yes. close to you. Ah, so there is no lower limit, Jeff. It's a, it's right. a, bit, of a bit of a mess. Excellent. Um, you got another one on there? Yeah, we were going to look at... Yes, this perhaps is one for you. Uh, from Mike Goldstraw. When the James Webb Telescope is launched into space, ah. at last... <laughs> what will Fingers we crossed. expect to see that we can't already with Hubble and radio telescopes, etc.? That, that's an excellent <laughs> question. Um, uh, NASA has certainly put quite a lot of money into launching uh, JWST into space, so I hope we will certainly make some, uh, make some new advances on what we can do at the moment. So the main thing that JWST does that Hubble doesn't do is it goes um, deeper, deeper into the infrared part of the spectrum. And so what that means is that... Um, 
Uh, objects at higher uh, objects at very high distance, their light will be more redshifted. So if we want to see um, the starlight and, and so on by going to the infrared, we can we can see deeper. We can see objects at, at, at higher distances. So um, the science that I know most about, I guess, is um, is looking for the very earliest galaxies. So we can see very distant galaxies already with the Hubble Space Telescope, but we can't see. The sort, we can't see the sort of objects that we think are like the very first galaxies that ever formed and the very first stars. So um, in, in terms of the theory of how stars and galaxies form, we think that the very first objects would probably be quite different, the way the stars formed, the way they collapsed. Yeah. Um, we, we might expect much more massive and very short-lived stars. So we expect those very first galaxies to be quite different to the ones we can see at the moment with the Hubble Space Telescope. So that's one of the things that I think will be really exciting. There's also really interesting stuff about um, following up exoplanets and so on, which I know a little bit less about, but there's lo lots of different things. So, so I am confident there'll be lots of really exciting results when it finally gets up there. I'm sure the money was worth it. Maybe you can <laughs> ask me that question. Sure, yes. So this is a question from um, Steve Harrowell. Uh, who says, I think it took nine years to get a probe to Pluto, so why is the one to Mercury taking nearly seven? Mercury's nearer, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, Mercury is, is, is nearer. Uh, Pluto was about nine years with New Horizons, mm. and it's the fastest object we've ever, ever launched. Mm. Yes, um, very fast. <coughs> it's taking us um, over seven years to get into orbit about Mercury. Mm. You could get to Mercury really quickly if you didn't want to stop. Right, <laughs> yes, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the secret is to arrive at Mercury going slowly enough. If, if this is a space probe and your head is Mercury, I've got to get there <laughs> and get yes. into orbit about you rather than just whiz by. Yes. Um, so mm -hmm. um, what Bepi Colombo is doing, it went out beyond the Earth. It's due to come back past the Earth in April next year, mm -hmm. then it will have two Venus flybys and use Venus's gravity to slingshot it in towards Mercury. Mm -hmm. And it will have six or seven flybys of Mercury and it will be slowing down all the time. Mm -hmm. So on the seventh time it approaches Mercury, it's going mm -hmm. slowly enough to be captured into orbit. Right. So Gosh. It, <laughs> you, you, you need so much delta V, so much change of velocity to get mm -hmm. to Mercury because you're going towards the sun, into the mm. sun's gravity while picking up speed yes, all the time. Yeah. Mm. You're losing gravitational energy, converting it into kinetic energy. Yes, so you have to slow down. Up, yeah. Bepi Columba has an iron drive and it's firing it in the direction of travel to slow down, not firing <laughs> it yeah. behind itself to speed itself up. It's got the brakes on yeah, almost gosh, all the time. Yes. So it's, it's purely a matter of, of getting there mm. slowly enough to get into orbit yes, rather than just flying orbital by. Yes, complicated dynamics. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Right. OK, yes. So um, I've got another question for you, Dave, which is one that, um, that, that came in earlier, which is from an S3, S283 student, Kate McDonald. Mm -hmm. So she's asking, when material was coalescing in the inner parts of our protoplanetary disk, how big would the lumps of stuff have to be um, before they formed something like solid rock rather than loose collections of individual minerals, what sort of conditions yeah. would you need? Okay, hi Kate. Um, you, you don't have to have big objects to, to grow rock. Um, the minerals that form in this solar nebula around the sun are growing from gas straight into silicate minerals. Mm -hmm. The kind of minerals that you find mm -hmm. growing inside volcanic lava right. can grow mm -hmm. in space, mm -hmm. just assembling an element at a time. You can get minerals like olivine and pyroxene formed in space. Mm -hmm. So it's not high temperatures necessarily. Mm. Well, it has to be cool mm. enough that they will condense and not mm. so cool that it all gets swamped by ice. Because if you get below mm. 273 Kelvin, there's so much water around that you'll get ice forming everywhere. Mm. So you've got, got a, a range of temperatures where silicate minerals can, can condense, but it's very low pressure and um, there's no size limit at all. You get dust-sized specks of, of, of minerals growing um, around a star as it cools. So mm. it's not big objects at all to get rocks. Mm. Right, yes. There's a live question coming here, but I'll put straight to you. This is okay. Alicia Rodericks. How do we know for certain the universe is expanding and not just mm. galaxies moving around in random motion, much like the particles in the air do? Right, yes, that's a very good question. Uh, and, um, and the answer to that comes from looking at um, the spectra of, of galaxies. So if we look at um, stars within our own galaxy, they are doing just that. They're moving in, in random directions. But the main way we know what direction things are moving in 
comes from looking at their spectra. So you split the light up into different wavelengths and then you see emission lines and particular features. And, um, and you can identify what elements are producing them and so on. So you know what wavelength they ought to be at. And then, um, and then if they're moving away from us or towards us, you get um, Doppler shifting and so on, which changes where you see them. So if you look at all the galaxies, um, um, and Hubble did this in the 1930s. Once you can take the spectrum, Hubble the astronomer, not Hubble, Hubble the space the, telescope. Hubble the famous astronomer, <laughs> not Hubble the telescope. Um, um, so, so early observations in the early 20th century established the fact that if you look at relatively nearby galaxies, they all seem to be moving away from us, which is obviously not what you would expect if uh, if they were moving in random directions. And since then, we've studied the spectra of millions of galaxies more recently with 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 surveys and so on and except for very nearby galaxies where more local gravitational effects, so within our local group, the Andromeda galaxy and, and so on, um, the orbits are more complicated. But once you look at the wider universe, pretty much everything is moving away from us and we have really direct observational measurements for that. So, so that's, that's where the idea that the universe is expanding comes from. There's other evidence as well, but that's, that's the fundamental one. Okay. Um, um, I've got a longer one from you, but we'll just deal with this one from John Goodman. Mm -hmm. Live. How magnetically active is the sun compared to other stars of the same type? I would say stars of the same type of the sun are equally magnetically active. I think, That's how uh, yeah, the type I think, is I think, defined. Yes, but. I mean, I think the answer is that is that they're they're pretty similar. So the sun isn't isn't particularly special in its its magnetic activity. But yeah. these M dwarfs with your. Mm. Uh, yes. Exoplanets close from yeah. potentially that, those Yeah, are... no, that's right. If you go to if you go to low mass stars, some of them seem to be quite magnetically active, and young stars also. Um, so when you go to um, young stars, okay. are often magnetically active. So magnetic fields are quite important in the process of how how stars form as well. So there's a lot of variety out there, but the sun isn't um, particularly atypical. Yeah. Okay. Let's deal with this longer question. Um, this is from S283 student Joe Sharp, who answered one of Joe's questions already. Looking at models of star and planetary system formation and looking at galaxies in their various forms and stages, there are a lot of similarities, at least superficially. So can you tell us about the similarities that we know of and about the differences? So star and galaxy formation. Right. Yes. So, so there's one obvious, really important um, similarity in the in the process, which is that uh, essentially gravity controls controls the whole process. So, galaxies form because gravity pulls a large mass of um, gas together, and then within those galaxies, stars form again because gravity is pulling pulling material together. And what happens is that as gravity um, pulls things inwards, um, as you were saying earlier about orbits. Um, as you go closer to the sun, um, as you, you're, you're losing gravitational energy and that's causing, in the, in the case of gas, that causes it to heat up. And with stars, eventually they get so hot that they start um, nuclear reactions. Whereas with, uh, with galaxies, actually, what happens is they, they get hot, but then the gas cools back down again. So there are some differences there. Um, one, of the big, one of the other big differences about the way gravity works is that with star formation, it's the gas itself, it's, it's the gravity of the gas yeah. that's controlling all of the processes. The, it's the gas that's in control. Whereas with a galaxy, we believe that all of the gas is embedded in this web of dark matter. And so there's more, there's more gravitational force than you'd expect if you just had the gas collapsing down. And so actually to make the models for formation work, you need to have this dark matter web and it's the gravity of the dark matter that's controlling it. And anyway, we've got a few um, little movies to, to give oh, yeah. you an idea of how this works. Um, so what I've got here is a movie of a collapsing um, molecular cloud. So this is star formation happening. This is a, a cloud collapsing down um, and, and you get all this filamentary structure and everything's getting denser and hotter. And in a minute, you'll start to see some little stars popping out and whizzing around. Um, but, but you're getting these clumps that are forming. And within these clumps, you've got um, entire stars and planetary systems, and you'll start to see a little bit of rotation. So one of the other similarities is that you've got lots of accretion, you've got stuff flowing in all the time, and that's what creates disks. So you've got the, um, um, what we call angular momentum, so, so everything starts to rotate in some particular direction. There you go, you can see some, some stars well, that there. It looks like a really complicated model. Was that months of computer time? Um, I, I imagine so, yes. I'm not sure of the details <laughs> okay. of this particular simulation. This one was done a few years ago now, I think. but. Um, but, uh, but within that, um, uh, they were actually able to track the individual. I'm just going to jump to the middle of this one. Um, but they were able to track the individual protostars. So when a protostar forms, you get a disk around the star. And that's where the planets form. 
Um, so here um, they've taken the individual clumps within that large cloud and you start to see disks spinning and, and forming. So, so disks are really important in planetary systems, obviously, um, but disks are important for, uh, for galaxies as well. So you can see all of this spinning. Um, and I'm just quickly um, going to jump to uh, a movie of, of a galaxy forming. This is a movie of the Milky Way forming. And, and you start to see some similar things happening. So you're seeing rotation and you're seeing matter falling inwards as well. So gravity's pulling stuff, stuff inwards. Um, but in this case, uh, as I mentioned, this simulation is assuming that this is all happening within this web of stronger gravitational forces from dark matter. So now you've got more stuff falling in. And as you jump forward in time, you start to get something that looks more like a galaxy that's spinning around. Um, but, but again, you've got this disk because, because of a preferred direction of, of stuff moving in. Um, and, and within that disk, the stars are forming, and within there, the, the individual um, planetary systems are forming around the stars. So there are indeed both um, similarities and, and differences, but, uh, but a lot of the underlying physics is really pretty, pretty much the same. Yeah. Okay. So, um, um, thanks for that question, Joe. Okay. This is one for me, I think. Mm -hmm. You want to read me that one? Uh, so this is a question from uh, Serena Bradbury. So she wants to know, um, can we analyze Martian rocks? And if so, can you get a whole rock chemical composition by remote, um, remote space, remote, remote observations? Okay. Um, the only analyses that we have of Mars <coughs> rocks that we've been in contact with are, that's not true actually. We have, we have Martian rocks on Earth, which are mm -hmm. meteorites from Mars, ah, which have been course. ejected from mm. Mars when a large impact has hit Mars, and mm. most of the jets that's flung out falls back to, on Mars, but some mm. gets into space, and some yeah. of those bits of Mars fall to Earth as mm. meteorites. Of course. And mm. we can recognise them as having come from Mars because there are little gas bubbles within them which mimic what we know of f from Mars's atmosphere ah. that have been measured by right. spacecraft that mm. have landed. Mm. So we can do all kinds of analyses on lumps of Mars we've got in the lab, Mm. Um, we have had spacecraft trundling around on Mars mm. um, with um, um, alpha particle emitters, which cause X-ray fluorescence. So mm. that enables us to measure the, the elemental abundance at the surface. Mm. And Curiosity, the rover on yes, Mars at the moment, is yes. zapping the rocks yes, with a laser right. beam yeah. and analysing the vapour that's created. Yes, yes that's right. Um, yeah. One of our PhD students was working on that data here, wasn't she? Yeah, oh, Fantastic yes, Candice. Yeah. Yeah. And mm. also, you can try to analyse rocks remotely orbiting above a planet by looking at how the surface reflects the sunlight. Mm. Uh, so it, 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 it's visible and near infrared spectroscopy. But the trouble with Mars is it has an atmosphere and it has weathering on the surface. Mm. So the surface is coated with yeah. dust and it's had a history of weathering. So it's hard mm. to get at the original mineralogy. Mm. If you have a planet with no atmosphere, <laughs> Uh, and you have the sun flaring and giving off x-rays, you can mm. use the, the fluorescent x-rays from the surface to get at the elemental abundances. Ah, right. That's Does actually that the British, that that's the British lead experiment from Leicester University on Bepi Colombo, ah, the x-ray spectrometer yeah. called MIX. Mm. I'm a co-investigator on it. Mm. And that will give us the abundances of the elements. And that's one way Brilliant. we'll find out about mm. those explosive volcanic deposits. So you can do it remotely. Mm. Uh, and you can do a whole planet that way. If yeah. you're relying on meteorites, you don't know exactly where on the planet they've yeah. come from. Yes. And if you're relying on a rover, it's got mm. a limited range. Mm. So each technique has mm. um, pros and cons, basically. Complementary information. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. I've got a question for, for you. Okay. Let's go do, deal, this, deal with this one uh, from, from okay. um, Victor Abrevsky. Okay. Um, he asks, is there any possibility that in the near future we'll have good enough telescopes to allow us to observe a planet that's not in the Milky Way galaxy? Right, yes. So that is definitely a challenge for our, uh, challenge for our telescopes. So um, obviously we've detected quite a lot of planets around other stars now. I think mm -hmm. um, I should check the uh, S-283 uh, textbook, but it's certainly more than 3,000, something like 3,000 to 4,000 um, something like yeah. um, exoplanets. So we certainly know that there are a lot of planets out there around other stars, but the vast majority of them are pretty near to our own sun. So within um, uh, within a few thousand light years, essentially. So so that's a fairly small mm -hmm. portion of the size of our, of our galaxy. So essentially it's easy to do it relatively nearby and it's pretty hard to do it once you get outside our, our local neighbourhood. So, um, so the method that's uh, been most successful now in terms of number of discoveries is the transit method. 
So that's when you've got, um, you monitor a bright star and, uh, and when, um, uh, and you see dips in the light curve. So, so the brightness dips down if something goes in front of the, um, in front of the star. So, so if, if, a, if a planet goes in front of the star, you get these little dips, but the dips are pretty, um, are pretty small. Reminds me to mention that 11th of November, next month, Mercury is going in front of the sun. Ah, You'll right, see yes. a tiny so dip <laughs> in the sun's brightness. It's a transit of Mercury. It's the transit last one until 2030 something. That's very important. Starts for the about date, half for the past midday in your, in your and diaries. It, it ends after sunset. Excellent. Yes. Well, so this method works quite well for Mercury and nearby <laughs> planets. Um, but unfortunately, using the transit method in a different galaxy is very, very far beyond what we can do at the moment. Essentially, you need you just need an incredible precision in how well you can measure the brightness because the proportional dip in the light is really small. It's, mm. it's a tiny yeah. percentage of the light. So you need to, to be able to eliminate all sources of background. You need to be able to really stably monitor it so that you know that everything else that's happening is, is, is not going to interfere. Um, you need to be able to resolve an individual star as well, which is pretty difficult to do in, in another galaxy. It's not quite impossible to just see the details so that you can pick out individual stars. So, so Hubble can do this in our nearest galaxy, Andromeda. It can pick out just about some of the individual brightest stars, but, but getting the quality of data that you need to do transits is difficult. Mm. There is one method that people have been thinking about using for detecting planets in other galaxies, and that's microlensing. So microlensing is when you've got, um, uh, again, you've got something passing in front of a star, but this time it's a more, a more distant star. And, and what happens is that the light from the distant star gets bent because of the gravity of the, of the object that passes in front, and that magnifies the, the background star. So you get a blip in the brightness, and that tell, can tell you that there's a planet there in principle. So there have been some calculations and estimations about the possibility of using that method in Andromeda or in um, the Magellanic Clouds, perhaps. So again, going back to our, our dwarf yeah. and satellite galaxies, it's still very, very, very difficult. <laughs> so yeah, but it's, it's a one-off event, isn't it? A microlensing event. You can't go back and study the same phenomenon with a well, not necessarily with the same with the same with the same background star. So so yeah, so so you have to mo the, the 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 gist of it is you have to monitor a very very large number and then yeah. find a way of picking out the events that are that are interesting. So that's again, it's a really difficult prospect to do in a distant galaxy. What would we learn from discovering? exoplanets in another galaxy. We, we mm. know that most stars in our galaxy have planets. So yes. yeah. is it likely that in other galaxies there are not planets? I don't think it's likely we'll discover that things are very different in other galaxies. No, I mean, there are some ideas about sort of different conditions might produce slightly different numbers of planets. But I mean, fundamentally, we think that most stars will have planetary systems. And that's not going to be very different in Andromeda to, to the Milky Way. Um, and, uh, and also we know, um, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the current research effort in exoplanets is going into really trying to characterize and identify really good nearby systems that we can study in detail and properly understand their composition. And even that's going to take a while with, with future missions. So, so I think it's going to be a long time before we know very much about the specifics of planets in, in other galaxies. And possibly yeah. that's not, not the most important question to ask okay. about exoplanets. Should we deal with that one? Yes. So this is one for you. Um, so this is from uh, uh, Ronnie McLean, who's a student on S283. Uh, and the question is, is there any update on the cause of asymmetric hemispheres of the terrestrial planets and the moon? I saw it mentioned in a new scientist special from 1975. So are there any other examples in the rest of the solar system? Um, thinking of Iapetus and possibly Pluto. OK. Um there are a lot of solid surface planets with asymmetries. The moon's mm. not a planet, but the near mm. side is different to the far mm. side. The thrust yeah. on the far side is thicker than on the near side, mm. as a result of which the basaltic magma that's risen towards the surface is able to flood out across the surface yeah. on the near side. And we have the maria, but they're mm. very rare on the far side. That could be um, because of how the moon are created in multiple stages from the disk of debris around the Earth after the moon yeah. forming impact. Pluto is asymmetric, again, not a planet. Mm. Um, mm. It's got this feature called Sputnik Planitia, which is probably a, a, an impact basin that's been flooded by nitrogen ice that has welled out. So mm. that's an impact related feature. Iapetus, the moon of Saturn that's asymmetric, um, has the leading hemisphere is very dark. It's covered in dust. The trailing mm. hemisphere is cleaner ice 
and is uh, is much brighter. So that's because of what it's orbiting through. So it's not to do with um, mm -hmm. the geology of its surface. It, it's just that its its leading face is going into a, a stream of dust. Mm -hmm. um, Mars is asymmetric. Its northern hemisphere is low lying. Its southern hemisphere is very high and very ancient, mm -hmm. very cratered. Uh, it's been suggested the low lying northern hemisphere of Mars is a result of an impact. Mm -hmm. So. Um, who am I talking to here? Who asked uh, this Ronnie, question? Ronnie, yes, yes. Ronnie. Um, there are many causes of asymmetries. We don't understand them all. Um, there are planets without asymmetries. Venus mm. Mm. Um, doesn't have a hemispherical asymmetry. I suppose the Earth has a, a hemispherical asymmetry because mm. one side of the globe is the Pacific Ocean with no mm. continents in it. But the Earth is reconfiguring itself all the time mm. through plate tectonics. The continents drift apart and come together. So, so with, with Venus, we know that, do we, about the surface? Because obviously what you see... We know Venus's about... surface from radar mapping. Yeah, We've had radar, mm -hmm. one good radar mapping image called Magellan, which has mm -hmm. mapped the entire surface. And uh, okay. uh, it's quite varied, but there are no global asymmetries. Right, okay. Um, we're running out of time. Um, there have been some more live questions, though. Um, um, Keith... Abrathat is saying, assuming the Big Bang created a glob of galaxies all moving outwards, is there an area in the centre that is a very low density? Ah, yes. Um, so this is this is a this is a, a, a very um, common question. It is quite a difficult one to get your head around. So um, so the concept of the Big Bang as a, as an explosion makes everybody think that there must be a centre where the Big Bang came from, and everything's been moving out from it. But actually, the way, uh, the way it works is that space is expanding everywhere. So there isn't really one place. Yeah, so if you, were in a, if you were in a different location in the universe, you'd also see everything moving away from, from... Basically, everything is getting separated further apart. The way things are being driven apart is somehow a process that's affecting every single location, essentially in the same, in the same way. So there's no centre to so there's the no, universe. There's no particular place that, that's different. Right. Do you know anything about the star Methuselah? Craig Ferguson Ooh. says it's been aged <laughs> older than 13.8 billion years, which oh. would be older than the uh, accepted very, age of the oh, universe. That's a very it? good question. I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that one. I think I might have to look, look that one up and, and pop an answer on the, on the forums. So, okay. Uh, so yes, I mean, stellar ages are, stellar ages are quite, uh, quite tricky to do. Um, so, uh, so I'll, yeah, um, yeah, I don't know do what method. Yeah, date the age of a star? Yeah, so individual stars, um, usually you can use information about the chemistry and the, and the metallicity um, because um, the older the stars, the earlier they formed in the history of the universe, the less they should have in the way of heavy elements from, from, uh, uh, from the enrichment yeah. from episodes of star formation. But, um, but I, d I, d I don't think that would ever give you a star that was older than the age of the universe. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about the details of this yeah. one, so okay. I'm going to have to look it up. And <laughs> Annette, Annette Hunsley is asking, what are your thoughts on us aiming to land humans on the moon again? Worth investing or should we look to other planets to increase our understanding of them, such as Mars? Okay. Buzz Aldrin would say, get your ass to Mars. That's what he's, he's got a t-shirt saying, get your ass to Mars. <laughs> um, yes. Mm. Um, I think we're going to have people on the moon. The Chinese are going to want to go to the moon. It's mm. going to happen whether we want it to or not. Yes. I have um, to say, I'm very boring on human space travel. And I actually think that um, we should send the robots into space um, to do the scientific observations. And, um, and, and the ideas of colonizing other planets are, are a bit of a distraction from trying to sort out our own planet. So. You're too young to have been inspired by the Apollo program, aren't you? I, I am slightly too happening. young to have been inspired by the Apollo program, I'm afraid, <laughs> yes. Um, no, I'm afraid uh, my, uh, my, my thoughts are with, uh, with, uh, with the robotic experiments and, and also um, tackling climate change and all that kind of stuff on, on our own planet as well. Yeah. Mars is the only planet entirely inhabited by robots. <laughs> There's only one there. Mm. there. Mm -hmm. um, we are running out of time. Um, thank you, everybody, for the, the live questions. Yes. Judith, thank you for coming along. You're it's very been welcome. Fun. It has, yes. Thank you, everyone. We're going to have another um, Planets, Moons, possibly Stars as well chat on Thursday, the 5th of March. Mm -hmm. We'll let OU students know about yes, it. Yes, we'll make and sure it'll be on Facebook aware. forums mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Kate and Ben in the back room for making this possible. Thank you for taking part. Let me just look at the widgets. We've had 37 of you in the UK and Ireland, eight of you from elsewhere in Europe. So nice to know. 
Nobody's had a go at the other two widgets. What are you studying? And oh, I spent ages setting up those widgets. <laughs> oh, well, you anyway, know for next Anyway, thank time. you for taking part, everybody. <laughs> Thanks very and, much. Uh, thank you. See you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye.